unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language, but the word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the word. Today, I want to talk about a very important aspect of the presence of God. Um, And it's important to understand, because if you do not understand how the presence of God works, then how are you going to relate with him? How are you going to evoke the deepest sense of the presence of God on the earth? And for that then, to see signs, miracles, and wonders um, demonstrated in your life, manifesting in your story, and in your everyday life. The life of demonstrating power is supposed to be a consistent life and regular life in the life of a Christian. All you need, and we all know that, is the presence of God on your life. As deep as the degree of the presence of God on your life is as deep as the effect and power of God operating on your life. And that's demonstrating it to the world, showing it. Okay? And I see that many believers are functioning under the lower forms of the presence of God. The inferior forms of the presence of God. And because of that, they live inferior lives. They live lower lives. They live lives without results, lives without a certain kind of glory, lives without a certain kind of anointing, lives without a certain kind of power, lives without a certain kind of consequence. And you are a child of God. God has invited you to the deepest realm of his presence. But how do we get there? We need to understand the character of the presence of God. We need to understand the forms of the presence of God. And today, I want to take time to teach about the three major forms of the presence of God for you to understand how they work and what it means in these forms. When the Bible says that they have a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof, what does that mean? Because there are forms in the presence, concerning the presence and the glory of God. And to understand these forms helps you understand how to function in the highest and the deepest form of his presence. Shout hallelujah. Now, when we read both from the Hebrew and the Greek, we want to understand firstly what is the presence of God. Because perhaps even when we define it from the English term, presence, not many people are able to interpret it fully from the original context of what God means when he says, my presence is with you. The presence of God is here. Does that mean that he is there in person only? What really is the presence of God? When we read, again, the word, the presence of God from the Hebrew, it's a word called paunim, which means the face of God. So the presence of God, actually everywhere we see in the Old Testament where they're speaking about the presence of God, they're speaking about the face of God, the countenance of God. And in the Greek translations, when we get the New Testament to translate his presence, the presence of God, the Greek word there is prosopon. Prosopon again means the face of God. So both in Hebrew and Greek, when we're defining the presence of God, we are talking about the face of God. The face of God. So when a man says, I have seen your face and have lived, he's talking about a certain depth and form of the presence of God and he's amazed that he has lived. The Bible speaks about Moses. How the Bible says that he spoke to God face to face. He beheld the very similitude of God the Father, the very countenance of God. It means that he was functioning in a very deep realm of the presence of God. So when we're talking about the presence of God, we're talking about the face of God and how it interacts with man, with the earth, with all the realms of the spirit. And I say that there are three forms of that presence. There are three forms of that face, of that countenance, and how he deals with us. And I will begin with the first form. Of that presence. That first form of that presence, I could call it the general 
form of his presence, the indiscriminate form of his presence, the broad form of his presence. That one is everywhere, all right? It's everywhere. In the book of Psalms, the 139th chapter from the 7th verse, the psalmist says, Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Or whither shall I flee from thy presence? You know, the word there, uh, presence, is paunin. Whither shall I flee from thy presence? And he says, if I ascend up in heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, you're there. You see, that's general. That's indiscriminate. It's everywhere. God is everywhere. God is everywhere. God is in the clubs. God is in the bars. God is on the streets. God is at your business, at your workplace. God is here. God is where you are. That's a general form of it. It's powerful also. Very powerful, if you think about it. Because the ability of God to create everything wherewith he dwells is power. If you're saying he's in the mountains, who created the mountains? He made the mountains. He made the forest. He made the trees. He made the valleys. He made all these things. It's powerful. He's everywhere. All things are upheld by his hand. He sustains all things by his presence. So in that form of that kind of presence, we can only speak about the general sense of that presence. That is not the presence that the Christian can lean into to function concerning the things of the kingdom. But it's a wonderful confirmation of the affirmed existence of God. So when we see how life is created, we see God. That is why when, for example, when I meet people who say, oh no, me, I'm an atheist, I don't believe in the existence of God. Sometimes I want to ask them, how, how then do we come to exist? How then does everything we see come to exist? And they start to tell you, oh, you know, evolution, and then in the beginning there was this big bang and that whole theory, you know, they, they start to bring out all manner of theories about the creation of the earth and the wisdom of Mother Earth and how things have evolved and changed and mutated from one generation to another and how now we come to become human beings. I don't know how long it's going to take for again human beings to become some in their own mind. And sometimes I can't help to think, what a faith. These guys have faith. Because if you look at how the world is, if you look at just how beautiful, you know, creation is, and a guy can actually believe that it came out of nothing, that's too much faith. That's too much faith. And they're there saying that they're atheists. You see? So the, the, the point is that we see a lot in the world, a lot in the world, that you cannot doubt that there must be a superior God. There must be a superior person. There must be someone responsible for the order of things and the life as we know it, both of the living and unliving things. There has to be. There has to be. And we, we cannot doubt that. But that very form of his presence, that very form of glory, he dwells in all things. Even the beasts that creep on the ground, there is a form of presence that is with them. The form of life that is with them. The plants that come out of the ground, there is a form of life that is with them. You see? And there's an energy, spiritually, connected to these things. And that energy is the form of his presence. All right? But that is not the presence, again I say, that man was created for. That is not the presence that was meant to sustain man. And that is why when we get to the next form of presence, we're talking about the presence that was made for man. Okay, I want to talk about it that way. There's a kind of presence that was made for the first man, for the first Adam, for the man which was a living soul. There was a presence that was available for a man which was a living soul. And it was most defined in the space of the purity of the heart of that man and that holiness of that man. In his uh, most innocent, his most... Um, pure, his most refined person, when he had just created Adam in the garden, there was a certain realm of presence that was given to any living soul in man. And that is why when you see the relationship that God had with Adam, and people take that lightly, but you see, when you look at the creation story, it's so amazing just how easily man related with God, how easily they talked with God, and how easily God talked back with them. 
He tells him, you shall eat of every tree in the garden. Man is hearing. It's not just a thought that came to their head. No, the voice is so clear to them that you shall eat of every tree in the garden, uh, you know, except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Because the day you shall eat of it, and that day you shall therefore surely die. There was a tree of life. Man was instructed clearly. He was instructed clearly. And interestingly, that voice never left man even at the fall. When man ate the forbidden fruit, the scriptures are clear. The voice of the Lord came in the cool of the day. And they could sense, they knew that God was there. There was a form of presence. They knew how to discern that he had come for them. He had come to relate with them. He had come to talk with them. And you see Adam and Eve hiding. Why are they hiding? Because they knew a certain form. They connected with a certain form. They related with a certain form of his glory. They related with a certain form. And so that is why they hide. Adam, where are you? God says, where art thou, Adam? And oh, he says, you know, I'm hid, I'm here, I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. What is Adam hiding himself from? What is Eve hiding herself from? They are hiding themselves from a certain presence. It's there. They feel it. They sense it. It is so distinctive that they have to hide from it. They can even discern that if we sit around here, or if we hide in this circle, in this corner, perhaps it will not be able to spot us, of course, how wrong they are. But at least there's a consciousness in them that that form of presence is with them. That form of presence is with them. So when you tell me in the New Testament that a spirit being, a believer, is struggling to hear God, or is misinformed in the thought that they're hearing God, yet they actually don't hear God, it's something about how... Uh, we have taught God, how we have defined God, how we have, you know, um, related with God. What I'm trying to say is that it's amazing that the presence of God, that form of presence for any living soul of man, you know, the Bible says it breathed into him the breath of life and he became a living soul, not a living spirit, a living soul, not a living spirit, a living soul. The first Adamic had an inactive spirit. If that spirit was in that man, then it would be, should be inactive. If you say that the spirit in Adam was there. Because again, when we read the Bible, many times where we read in the Old Testament spirit, they actually refer to soul. They actually refer to soul. So if you insist and say, oh no, but I insist that the man had a spirit, then it was inactive. There's no sense of it. He became a living soul. That's why he says in the first Corinthians, he says, the first Adam was made a living soul. 1545, and the last Adam was made a quickening spirit. See the difference? There's a difference. So he didn't say that the first Adam was made a living spirit. The first Adam was not a living spirit. That is why when we're talking about the man which is carnal, in Corinthians, he says the carnal man cannot receive neither design the things of the spirit. When we read it from the Amplified Version, he says the natural, the non-spiritual man. The non-spiritual man. The fallen nature related with God from the soulish realm. Their souls connected to the spirit realm and connected to God which was spirit. But they themselves were not awakened to the spirit. They are. That only happens in the new birth. That only happens in the new birth. So, when we see how God is relating with man, the living soul, we see even when he clothes them in the garden, and then he banishes them out of the garden. We still see that they are able to communicate with God. And that's how we see Cain and Abel later relating with God. You see, when Cain kills Abel, God comes to him and tells him, what have you done? Where is your brother? He says, am I my brother's keeper? And then he tells him, you know, the earth cast you from the earth which has opened its mouth to swallow or take in the blood of your brother. And then we see Cain in language as God pronounces his destiny, the judgment on his life. He's scared. His heart is at fear because he knows that if God has dealt such a punishment as this, I think somebody is going to kill me or something. And in Genesis, the fourth chapter, the 14th verse, Cain tells God, behold, thou hast driven me out this day from the face of the earth. And from thy face shall I be hid. Okay, he's saying from thy face, the word their face again is the very word presence, paunim, right? 
I have been driven from your face. I have been hid from your face. That means your presence has left me. And I shall be as a fugitive and a vagabond in the earth. And it shall come to pass that everyone that findeth me shall slay me. Cain thought that that meant that God was going to take his presence from him. But he was still a living soul in its most fallen nature. If he had understood God clearly, he would know that even at the fall of his father and mother, God still communicated with them. God still related with them. But you see, he thought, no, with this kind of judgment and punishment, I think you're hiding your presence away from me. This was Cain's own attitude, not God's mind. The 15th verse says, because it says, whoever shall find me shall slay me. God says, "Uh uh-uh, therefore, whosoever shall slay Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. You see how God is speaking? He's not talking to Cain, that whoever shall slay you, I shall avenge seven times. No, he has spoken a command in the spirit realm to every devil, to every court, to every fallen angelic. He's saying, whoever shall slay this fellow, seven times shall I take their life for vengeance. That means God had commanded the spirit realm never to touch him. Never touch him. He's not talking to him. He's talking to the spirit realm. He's talking to Satan, the demons that are walking in that time. He's talking to the fallen angels of that day. He's saying, nobody should touch this fellow. Because if you do, I shall avenge his life seven times. Remember, there were not many people on the earth. And the Bible says, now listen to the 16th verse. Cain went out from the presence of the Lord. He went out. He disconnected himself from the presence of the Lord. God did not banish Cain from his presence in spite of his weakness. No, Cain left the presence of God. That was not supposed to leave any human being with a living soul. He was supposed to dwell with any human being with a living soul. That means it's possible for a human being to disconnect from the presence of God concerning the living. It's possible. So somebody does not need to be a very deep man of God to hear God. There are people who are not born again, but they have dreams. They have visions. And whether the dream comes to pass, whatever visions they see, manifest. They are not born again. They are not born again. They are not of the new birth. But they can see in the spirit. They can connect to the will and purposes of their own lives. Why? Because living souls were made and made to be connected to a certain form of the presence of God. Some use that presence for destruction. Some use that understanding for manipulation, but it's supposed to be present for every man. It's supposed to be present for every man. We see God coming to Pharaoh in a dream. Pharaoh did not have a relationship with God. But we see God connecting to his soul, giving him a dream for the destiny of his people, of Egypt. It doesn't mean that Pharaoh had a relationship with God. We see God appearing to Laban, telling him, do not harm Jacob. He says, your God appeared to me and told me to do you no harm. He did not believe in the God of Jacob. He was chasing after his gods when he was uh, running after them. But God could still speak to them. God would speak to anything and anybody. Any living soul had a certain form of presence that would invite the voice of God. And a certain protection and preservation of God. So you must understand. And unfortunately, some believers, they are struggling. You see, that is of the fallen nature. You see, the fallen nature still relates with God a certain way. But some believers cannot even relate with God in that realm. They cannot hear the voice of God in that realm. They cannot connect to his presence in that realm. My father, before he became born again, my biological father, and during that time the whole family had believed. He was Roman Catholic. One time, he was sleeping. And it was about 2 a.m. in the morning. And he woke up and he had had a vision that his mother was not well. And he started walking around the house, 2 a.m. And he kept saying, my mother is not well. My ma- 2 a.m. My mother is not well. My mother is not well. My mother is not well. And then he gets a phone and then he tries to call because she was in the village. And then he gets a phone and starts to call in the village. Calling and calling to try to get in touch with anyone who is in the village. He called my uncles and all of them at 2 a.m. were asleep. My aunties and cousins 
in the village. He tried to call him and all of them were asleep. And he kept saying, no, my mother is not well. He called to 3 a.m. He called to 4 a.m. He's still trying to call. My mother is not well. Now, that very time, about 5 a.m. in the morning, he actually woke us up. Pray if you have to, but something is not right with my mother. This man is not born again. He's not born again. But he said, there's something wrong with my mother. I don't know what it is, but wake up, wake up. He wakes up my mom. I remember, I'm like, what's happening? What's happening? 5 a.m., we get a call from the village that a certain fellow had broken into my grandmother's house and beaten her up. And I think he wanted to rob her and he beat her up so badly her eyes swelled and you know her arm was damaged we actually had to take her to hospital the next morning somebody broke into my grandmother's house and beat her up almost to death and he wanted to rob her he was a robber but a man who was not born again had not built a relationship with god had that feeling in his spirit that his mother was not okay that his mother was not okay and you are a believer, but you can't even sense danger. The Bible says, a prudent man foreseeth evil from afar and hideth himself. A prudent, he doesn't need to be born again. As long as he's prudent, he can foresee evil. Some of you still wait for men of God to tell you your future. To look into your future and tell you who you're going to get married to. And how many children you're going to have. No, any living soul was made to connect to God a certain way. Any living soul. That is why you have relatives who are not born again, but they have premonitions. They have dreams. They speak things and they come to pass. And that exists. My father's been like that. When he says something, you worry because he has that thing on him. When he says that this is going to happen, you have to worry because he is always accurate. I remember one time I did a business deal and it went bad. And he came to my room. I was very disappointed, very disappointed. I was very hurt. And he came to my room, and I had done this business deal with a certain uh, lady. We were business partners. And my father had no prior knowledge of it. And so this lady that I was dealing business with sort of sidestepped me and, you know, played me out. And I made a huge loss. And so I was in my room, very disturbed. And he came back at home, and he knocked on my door. Boop, boop. Hey, Grace, how are you? I'm fine. He says, there's a lady I met once with you. Her name is something, something. He says, yeah? Because he met me once with her. I said, hi, hi, this is so-and-so. But I never told him anything. And he says, why do I have a feeling that woman sidestepped you and robbed you of your money? I just feel it. I just feel it. Why do I just have that feeling? He did not know that woman beyond the fact that one time he met me with that lady and said, hello, hello. I introduced and that was it. But his soul picked it that there was something wrong with this woman. And then I wasn't connecting anything. I'm telling you that a living soul can connect with a certain form of presence and can relate with God a certain way. I saw it in my father's house. You see? So it's possible. And some of you who are listening, you know that. God revealed himself to us in dreams even before we knew him. We had experiences even before we knew him. The human soul can connect to God. Can connect to God can't connect to God. That's why I said, how can you be born again? More than just a living soul. And you cannot connect to the praise of God and his voice. How can that be? How can he not be able to talk to you? How can he not be able to communicate to you? How can he not be able to move with you and walk with you except you don't know how it works? Except you don't know how it works. And that is why from the fallen time, you realize that God started to make his presence exclusive to particular individuals that he had raised, predestinated for particular assignments and mandates. It became exclusive after the fall. He would have to get an Abraham, disconnect him from his own family and kindred, and then take him a place and start to relate with him. That was exclusive. And then anything that is connected to the man God has exclusively separated for his presence and instruction and voice, then everything around there connects to the glory and the blessing of that individual. You see, he was with Moses in that time exclusively. You see, he was with Elijah in that time exclusively. He was with Elisha in that time exclusively. He was with Isaiah in that time 
exclusively. He was with Ezekiel in that time, exclusively. He was with David in that time, exclusively. So anything that would spread that kind of presence had to emanate from the man with whom he had exclusively connected to. But that didn't mean that he never spoke to the rest. He did. But he always had a certain exclusive presence that he would increase of degree on particular individuals to carry certain assignment and mandate. But I mean that the rest couldn't know, but there was always this one person or two or three in every dispensation that he sent to connect, you know, that generation to a deeper realm of him or to hear his voice deeper concerning their purposes. But daily life, living life, bread and water, clothes on your body, career, those are things God can speak even to the most fallen man. Hallelujah, glory to God. And so that's why we see that that kind of relationship for those which were exclusively chosen of God, there was a deliberate heart for them to cultivate it, to keep in a certain way. The Nazarite vows we see with the Samuels was to preserve something, to domesticate it, to make sure that they walk and adapt in the realm God has exclusively called them so that they can maintain a certain presence. So I see Moses going on the mountain, particular days and coming back with his face uh, beaming and shining. So bright. Because they needed a certain... Because it's one thing for God to separate that man exclusively. It's another for him to maintain that depth of form. He had to do certain things. That's why the period of heart is important. You see, the psalmist picked it and he understood. Create in me a clean heart, oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. And he says, cast me not away from your presence. He knows that the moment I disconnect from a certain purity of spirit, then I'm going to be disconnected from a certain realm of presence. He's not talking about the generic form of presence. He's talking about the exclusive form of presence because he was a man after God's own heart. It didn't mean that God was going to disconnect from him. No, he would still walk with him as David. But David was more than just David. He was a man after God's own heart. He was the chosen voice and king of that dispensation. And he's the patriarch of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So that kind, that realm of presence carried a certain exclusivity. That doesn't work in the New Testament. The presence of God is not exclusive. It's special men of God. That's not how the New Testament works. And that is why the church is so far behind in the ways of the spirit. Because they think that today God still works in exclusivity. Uh Uh-uh. That was still in the other realm. Because he needed to sustain humanity on a certain purpose and a certain course. In spite of their indifference. If he had to speak beyond the food to eat and the clothes to wear and the children and the wives to marry. If he needed to sustain generations and the sovereignty of a people. He needed exclusive voices to raise in that particular time. Just to carry them until the New Testament dispensation. God at sundry times and in diverse manners spake. And to the men of old and the prophets of old, the fathers. And he says, but now he has in the last days spoken unto us by his son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also the eons, the worlds were made. And now when we get into the New Testament, we embrace a higher form, the highest form of God's presence and voice. Praise God. Hallelujah. And so to understand this form, I need to help you firstly understand two things. When you read the Bible and you read something like Numbers 14 verses 21, it says, As truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. This is God saying, my glory shall fill the earth. And then you read the portion of scripture like in Habakkuk 2.14 where it says, For the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. These two scriptures are different. I cannot help you understand the highest form of God's presence with us if you cannot find the difference, if you cannot draw the dichotomy between these two scriptures. In the first portion of scripture, the earth is filled with the glory of God. In the second portion of scripture, the earth is filled with the knowledge of the glory of God. There's a difference. So, we are in the times of Habakkuk 2.14. You understand? Not only is the glory of God in the earth, but God is filling us with the knowledge of that glory, with the revelation of that glory, with the understanding of that glory, with the demystification of the mystery of his glory on the earth. You must understand that. The new creation, when you cross from darkness to light, when you cross from the fallen nature into the new birth, 
The form of the presence for the new birth is different. That's the third form. The new birth has a certain realm of the presence. Because if any man be in Christ, any man, any man, any man, it doesn't matter where they are and how they are. He says, if any man be in Christ, the Bible says he's a new creature. All things are passed away and behold, all things are become new. And the next line says, and all things are of God. Of God. Now let's begin there. That's the beginning. That's all. Glory to God. That's the beginning of the new birth. When you become born again, God doesn't deal with you like I have been explaining of any fallen nature or sense. This is a very elevated glory. And that is why when Paul starts to walk with God, the symbols and artifacts that were used in the Old Testament dispensation started to melt. The elements of the Old Testament melted. Because remember, when God uses exclusivities, you start to see him send symbols, all right? Things like the tabernacle. The tabernacle was a sort of a symbol. I shall dwell there. But does he really dwell there? And then you see the Ark of the Covenant. These are all symbols of God's presence. But as we enter into the New Testament and Paul sees this mystery, these elements start to melt. He says, ah, wait, God does not dwell in temples built by human hands. He doesn't. But men used to die there. If a priest entered the wrong way into the Holy of Holies, that man would die. You see boys trying to hold the covenant box as it's falling and they're slain and struck dead. This is the presence of God, but a man has lost life. So it's one thing for you to understand the presence. It's another for you to live in the presence of God. In the presence of God. Because if you're indifferent, that very anointing can kill your flesh. It can kill you if you're indifferent. That very presence can kill you. So, this is the dispensation where God is increasing the knowledge of his glory. The revelation behind his glory. For us to see beyond what the normal eye can see. So that is why the conversations of Paul in the New Testament are changing. That is why certain faiths do not connect. Even though they believe the Torah, they believe the Old Testament. When it comes to Pauline letters, they don't connect to them. When it comes to the teachings of the new birth, they cannot connect to it. They don't even believe that Christ is dead and raised from the dead. They don't believe he walked the surface of his heart. Why? Because of what that could imply. The devil knows of what that could imply for them. But thank God if you understand this mystery. Thank God. Because I see Christians of the new birth who are even less of the form that was given to the man of the living soul. To the man of the soul. Who function less. Someone tells you, I've been praying for two years, but God is silent. What? I can't hear God. How does God speak? What? You're struggling for two weeks. What? And we also have the kind who are suffering from the spirit of hubris. You know, the spirit of hubris. The spirit that deceives a man of a place that they actually not. And so they assume and act like they're actually in that place. Only for shame. Someone says, I hear God. But everything they're saying about the God they hear just does not work. If you had God concerning that woman, why didn't she marry you? If you had God concerning that man, why isn't he your husband? And the spirit on this woman or that man will still insist that that man stole my wife or that woman stole my husband. For a certain man. Come on. What's wrong with you? Don't you understand? That if it is the will and the mind of God concerning a thing. He has the power to perform it. If it is your job. It has to come to you. If it is not your job. Look for yours. If it's your opportunity. It will open to you. If it's not your opportunity. Don't sweat it out. Don't sweat it out. I know a couple. That met and they said, oh, you know, God has spoken. And I could see that this was not God. But they were so convinced. So convinced. And this man was married. This young woman, she's not married. This man is married to a wife. His wife. They were married in church. Born again believers. And the man is saying, he's telling us that God has told him that the woman he's married is not his. The woman he married is not his. He's saying that woman who he's not married to is the one who is his wife. And I called the fellow. I told him, this is not how God works. The woman insisted, no, 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 no. We hear God. We hear God. The fellow, the moment he was going to separate with his wife, God slew him and he died. He died. The moment he was going to separate with his wife. God took him. 
I'm looking at this woman who insisted, if he was your husband, why is he dead? He was walking out of God's order. And you see that she can't get it up to now. That there's something wrong with how people hear God. And that's the danger we see in the church. That's why we see divisions. That's why we see decisions. That's why we see distractions. A man's life was taken because he had the wrong voice and insisted it was God. I warned him. I sat him down and I'm saying this because I warned him and I told him this is not God. He insisted. He says, no, I hear God. This woman I'm married to is not my wife. The moment he was going to sign divorce papers, God killed him. I know God took him. I knew it. I knew it. This was not the devil. This is God saying, let me take this fellow out because he's going to break the whole order. There was a bigger picture to this man's destiny, but it was destroyed because today people don't hear God and they insist that they're hearing God and they cannot listen to men who hear God. They cannot listen to men who hear God. They cannot seek divine counsel to hear what is really God saying. Because part of the guiding lights of the spirit, even when you feel it's your inward witness, look for a man or a woman of the spirit and inquire of them and tell them, look, how does this go? How does this work? They'll direct you. They'll direct you. Circumstantial evidence is there too. How can you tell me that this man is married in the church with his wife and you are saying that God told you that that's your husband? How does that even work? You see, they cannot even hear God, yet they're in the new birth. That means the devil has crafted this so well that he has presented a certain familiar spirit. And I've always told people that there's a familiar spirit that speaks so like God that if you cannot discern it, it can destroy you in the deepest conviction of God told me. And that spirit cannot be rebuked. It only flees when you come to the knowledge of the truth. That is why I tell people, it doesn't matter how many prophecies are around you and how many prophetics are surrounding your life, never detach from the word of truth. Because the word of God has eyes. You see, it's sharper than a double-edged sword. It cuts asunder, separates the bone and marrow, exposes our hearts and thoughts for what they really are. It's the designer of that. The Bible says nothing is hid before him. You see, who? The word. So that means the word has eyes. For all things are naked. Amplified uses the word defenseless. They are exposed. They are defenseless to the eyes of him who we have to do. The eyes of who? The eyes of the word. The word of God has a certain vision. The eyes of God have a certain sight. That even if I say, oh, you know, I think God has told me this. And I insist God has told me this. If anything, one of the guiding lights of the spirit is the word. In whatever I say God has said to me, can I confirm it with his word? Because if his word is contrary to what I feel God has told me, then I have a problem. Because I am seeing what the word doesn't see. Hello? I am seeing what the word does not see. And there's a problem. You draw back a bit and humble. And I fear. Because when I saw this lady, I fear that she might die too. Not that I want her to die. That there's a way she sees life. It's sad. And I'm saying this, saints, because people die in the name of hearing God. People have made the gravest mistakes in the name of hearing God. People have gone into wrong relationships in the name of hearing God. People have built the wrong places and people have defiled altars in the name of hearing God. People are stuck in the name of hearing God. People have lost lives and have lost their own children and families in the name of hearing God. Ministries are destroyed in the name of hearing God. And so... The apostle in me speaks in love, hoping that somebody watching me will not lose their lives or their own in the name of I heard God. I heard God. How do you hear God against truth? Truth is the most absolute and pure sense of God's voice and message toward us. The spirit and the word agree. They don't disagree. They have never disagreed. Anyway, when we get to this New Testament, that kind and form of presence of the new birth is not exclusive. It's not to special men of God. It's not to special women of God. It's available for everyone who knows how to do the process. And everyone who knows how to connect and relate to it. But that reality begins with this revelation. And that is why when we talk about love, it's more than just the extension of love to your brother. No, no, no. 
I thought about the womb of love. When you talk about the love, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. We see he loved us before we first loved him. We see the invitation of that agape inviting us in the space of the highest form of love. Highest form of love. Because it's demonstrated through the light that is sent by Christ Jesus. And so when Paul is speaking in Ephesians, the third chapter, the 17th verse, if I will read the Amplified Version, he said, May Christ through your faith actually dwell, settle down, abide, and make his permanent home in your hearts. This is a space of faith. So Jesus is not in us because of what we do and what we don't do. No, he's actually abiding permanently in us because of our faith. Faith. What is faith? The substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. You should never doubt that Jesus is in you. That's a faith. Oh, you know, I've done this. I think God has left me. I think God has left me. God, come back. New Testament creatures even used to sing that song. Create in me a clean heart. Oh, 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 Lord. And they're remembering their sins. And renew a right spirit within me. And then they say, cast me not away from your presence, oh God. Listen. The New Testament believer cannot be cast out of the presence of God because the presence of God is within them. It's like God flipping you inside out. How does that happen? He says, I will never leave you, nor forsake you. I'll never leave you. He says, you have the Holy Spirit, which is a seal. You were sealed. The Bible says you were sealed. You know what it means to be sealed? That means you were spiritually knotted and tied together. He says you were sealed until the day of redemption. The Holy Spirit is permanent in you. He's a fixed mark. He's not just a static being in you who departs from you when you do something and then comes back in you when you're okay. No, you're dealing like the men of the fallen nature. You're dealing like the men of old. The psalmist was right to say that because he was a living soul. Souls have a limitation of relating with God. But you, which is a new creation and all things have become a God. All things have become a God. You cannot say that God can leave you. Or sometimes I feel, Apostle, that God has left me. You just feel it, but he hasn't. Because God is not supposed to dwell in your hearts through feelings. Hello? He says, may Christ through your faith actually dwell and settle down and abide and make his permanent home in your hearts. May you be rooted deep in love and founded securely on love. And the 18th verse says that you may know, that you may know. That means when you hate from the love that has invited you into the highest form, you know, of God's presence on your life and voice. He says, you may have the power to be strong, to apprehend and grasp with all the saints, God's devoted people, the experience of that love, which is the breadth and the length, and the height, and the depth of it, and that you may really come, really, really, the reality of this experience. Come to know practically, through experience for yourselves, the Bible says, the love of Christ that far surpasses mere knowledge without experience. That was of the fallen nature. Because they cannot fully experience love. God is love, and they don't have it in their hearts. How can they know love? We know love better because God is in our hearts. Somebody shout amen. amen. And he continues to say that you'll know that love of Christ, which far surpasses mere knowledge and without experience. And listen, that you may be filled through all your being and to all the fullness of God, that you may have, listen, the richest measure of the divine presence and become a body wholly filled and flooded with God himself. That means it's possible for you from the crown of your head to the soles of your feet to be full of God. So God is not just with you to heal the sick. No. He's full in you to heal the sick. God is not just with you to cast out devils. No. He's so full in you that you cast out devils. God is not just around you to raise a dead man. No. He's so full in you to raise dead bodies. That is the highest form of the presence of God. That is the inheritance of the new birth. That is why I don't get it when people go for inferior realms. Apostle, tell me, what is God saying? You're a new creature and you can't hear God. <laughs> Prophet, tell me. You're a new creature and you can't hear God. We, the prophetic, are supposed to confirm what is already affirmed in your spirit because you're a new creation 
And this voice is no longer exclusive. So even if I never confirm it, it shall still stay an affirmation. Oh, there are people, I will not leave until the man of God says something in my life. Listen, what does the word of God say? How can you sit under a teacher, a good teacher for years, and you say, what is God telling me? But you're seated next to someone. <laughs> the voice of God is coming through teaching. But you want it to come through some exclusive way for you to know that you hear God. And that is why the people who seek exclusivity don't have the results of that exclusivity. People who seek after exclusive voices are failing in life because they don't get it. That the new birth relates with God in a certain dimension because you are born again. God no longer even speaks to you because you have a living soul. No. The Bible says that he, oh Shabbat, he that is joined with the Lord, the Bible says is one spirit with the Lord. Do you know what that means? Do you know what it means to be one spirit with God? I wish we fully understand this knowledge that will come to the full knowledge of that glory. To be one with God. It's not what would Jesus do. No, it's what is Jesus doing. He says, for we hold the very thoughts and feelings of God. We have the mind of Christ, the Bible says. That's where God has invited you. So when you're praying for the sick, do you pray for them hoping God will heal them? Or do you pray for them knowing that you're fully filled and flooded with God himself and the stretching out of your hand on that sick man? Oh, sabra katalapa. That man has to be healed. When you enter a place, how do you see yourself? When you stand in a nation, how do you see yourself? But you see, the issue is that we have not actually defined this love to its depth. Why? Because we're preaching the law and the letter killeth. It killeth. In the fourth chapter again of Ephesians, the 15th verse, you see again, he brings how in the reality of speaking the truth in love, speaking the truth, Ephesians 4.15, speaking the truth in love, he says that we may grow up, now listen, into him, <laughs> into him, in all things, which is the head of even Christ, Oh my God, it's possible actually that as you're relating with a mystery of truth, as we're speaking truth, as we're speaking revelation, not just the visions we receive in the night God showed me, no. As we're speaking the truth, the oracle, his word, he says we are growing into him in all things. All that God is and has, glory doxa, is available for the believer Imagine a man who has grown up into God in all things. Who has grown up into God in all things. Which kind of man is that? Which kind of man would that look like? And God says, you're actually that man, that potential and ability I have already given by Christ. That's why the Amplified says I'm so contradictory. He says that that man is the true God. This is the Amplified. It's First John 5.20, the Amplified. And we know that the Son of God is come. And that the Son of God has actually come to this world. And he has given us understanding and insight, listen, to progressively perceive and come to know better and more clearly know him who is true. And the next line says, and that we are in him. Who is true in his son, the Messiah? And the next line in the Amplified says, This man is the true God and life eternal. This man is the true God and life eternal. That means the end of your life should be you and God in oneness, in the unity of that spirit. How can you pray without that unity? How can you connect without that unity? How can you relate without that unity? How can you demonstrate life without that unity? How can that even happen? It's not possible. It's not possible. And now we see how it begins from Adam. Genesis. He's talking to man. Even in his fallen nature, he's talking to man. And then when man falls, he seeks exclusivity and brings the prophets and the apostles, consecrates them and separates them for this work because he needs to work a great work in their lives. He needs to continue with the church to the end where now he speaks through Christ. And this Christ has invited us 
to the highest realm of God's presence. And the end of that presence is not the stuff he does outside you. It's the stuff he does in you to fill you with himself. Through love to grow into him in all things. And that man becomes the true God. Oh, some people call themselves God. No, we don't call ourselves God. God calls us gods. He says, ye are gods, but you die like mere men. He says, and the scriptures cannot be broken. He says, ye are gods. Ye are gods. Because you're one with God. It doesn't mean that we doubt the sovereignty of God, that we don't worship him and worship ourselves, or that we've met gods of ourselves. No, 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 no. We are sons of the living God. And he intends that we will become so one with him, that when the world sees us, they see him. Jesus says, when you see me, you see the Father. But you see, some people find it robbery and wrong to get into that unity. Or some abuse it because they think that in that unity, we shall express our liberties beyond the boundaries of truth. And I tell men, no man in that maturity can express a liberty beyond their boundary, the boundaries of liberty, because that man is hemmed in the highest realm of the purification of the spirit. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see the Lord. That kind of man cannot set himself against God because he knows nothing of himself. Paul says, I'm dead, yet I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, and the life that I live, I now live, not by the faith in, but by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So I live by the faith of the Son. And as Jesus in me is believing, Paul says, it's a small thing for you to judge me. He had hit that realm. For I know nothing of myself. I'm not conscious of anything of myself. Yet in here am I not justified. But he that justifieth me is the Lord. He's carrying this man to a point where he takes that whole faculty, the whole conscience, the whole heart, and he purifies it to the sense where that man knoweth not himself without God. He is one spirit with God. That's the purity of that presence. That is the church God is coming for. That is without spot nor wrinkle. That through revelation has been invited to the knowledge of that glory. I pray that they might be one as you are with me. They in me. Listen to Jesus. I in you. That we might be one. You see the mystery. They in me. I in you. That you might be one. Or you in me. I in them. We might be one. The paradox of you in him and him in you. If my words abide in you. And if you abide in me. And if my words abide in you. You shall ask whatsoever you will. And it shall be done. He's talking about the inward infill. The water is in the well. And the well is in the water. You see that? The water is in the well and the well is in the water. That's where God wants. He just doesn't want to fill you within. No, he wants to fill everything without. That's the true baptism of the spirit. So it's possible to be flooded fully with God himself. It's possible to demonstrate a realm of power that the world has never seen before. It's possible to live in the highest form all character of his presence. And this is available not exclusively, but inclusively for all believers. For all believers. How can you say that you don't hear God? How does that even happen? That you're still seeing the voice of God. You see? Look at where God has invited you. Look at where God has invited you. I have seen the end of things. And I've seen... Where even certain elements in what we call truth melt. As they are taken away by higher forms of truths. Like the children of Israel thought that God could only dwell in a temple. And one day, the New Testament is telling us God does not dwell in temples built by human hands. But he could honor them with his presence at the level they were ready to understand him. Okay? And now, in the new birth, we become the temple. We become the temple. So I don't have to enter a certain cathedral to feel the praise of God. Because the presence is with this man. In fact, when John the Revelator goes in heaven in Revelations, he's looking for the temple Moses copied in heaven to draw because God told him, build according to the pattern that I shall show you on the mountain. Moses 
built according to a pattern he had seen. John goes to the presence where he knows the temple was according to the ways of Moses. And in Revelation 21, 22, he says, I saw no temple. In the very place where Moses saw a temple, John the Revelator could not see a temple. He says, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. In the very city where Moses saw a temple. What if even the realities of heaven are only beheld according to where we are able to behold God in the form we are able to see him? Because if the descendants of Moses met the descendants of John, they would fight. I mean the disciples, they would fight. Because our master had and saw a tabernacle and he copied the exact pattern God had showed him. So sometimes, even in the realms in which God invites us, and again, these are the things I fail to say, it is important to know that he will show us what we must see for the patterns of our dispensation and the fullness of that end to really see things as they are comes in the purification, in the sanctifications, in the consecrations of the understanding of the highest form of his presence. Of his presence. Otherwise, he appeared as men. The angels come and he's a man. He fights with Jacob the whole night. And Jacob says, I fought with God and my life was preserved. With God. But he came in a form of a man that actually Jacob would withstand. But can really Jacob withstand God? No. So it's wrong for Jacob to assume that that's the realm in which God functions. No. He just needs to touch a heap of his thigh. So the man would limp into destiny. But that ain't mean that that's where God is. God doesn't wrestle with man. He cannot. The Bible says the Spirit of God cannot strive with man any longer. He just shortens their life and they're gone. The Bible says the life of man is as grass. And the glory of it is as the flowers. When the Spirit comes, it blows the fleshly part of us. Elevates our spirits to the point where we must really behold that true form. If your vision of spirit has not beheld that very form... Christ is not yet fully a revelation. He's only a story and a man of history. The depth of our message is in the things that we're able to see. I've had experiences where God has opened scrolls for me in the vision and I could read them. But I could not present those scrolls as I read them. No, I have to take time to actually understand what is he saying. And in there then I have to wrap them as a message to the world. Because I see the fuller plan. And the scriptures for us seeing that God would justify the Gentiles through faith. He went afore preaching to Abraham this message. For in thee shall all nations be blessed. The scroll was opened to Abraham. And he told him for in thee shall all nations be blessed. That simple statement is the place where now Abraham starts to understand righteousness by faith. And righteousness through works. And then he seeks the righteousness of faith to be justified through faith. And it's through that that the building of this faith faith in love and in the demonstration of that power enables him not to stagger the promise and fully persuaded that he who promised was also able to do he becomes the father of all who believe but that mystery of faith demystified to Abraham came through an open scroll in a simple sentence for in thee shall all nations be blessed now the man which has the ability to read the scroll has the wisdom to take time to meditate contemplate until they interpret the articulation of God so they can array it in a purpose in a series of the prophetic words spoken or teachings and that is how we know our part when the book of Revelation talks about whoever takes a word off, out, or adds to this message, his part shall be robbed from the book of life. His part shall be robbed from the history of ministry. That is our part. Our part really is in the things that we see. It's the windows of the spirit that are open unto us and the consequent doors that come because of that vision. So I don't preach because I have to preach on Sunday. I preach because I behold a certain form. I want to pray with you. Raise your voices and let us start to pray right now. I don't know what you're going to pray, but all I know is that I've spoken so much. And by God's grace and wisdom, may he give you the utterance and the understanding to know what you really must pray for. Because in such summons, every man must pray from where they are. Come and raise your voice. Let's pray. Shalabatalaba. 
Rata katara brozo boko shatalapa. Robo zile makara broza laba kashatalaba. Roma satala pozo lobo zekenda. Hoza bako zile brakato labaza. Zopaya kashanda rabazo boko. Hasama ko brozo lobo. Reketele brozo boko zelepa. Randa labaza bakosha. Hosa katalapa. Rima talabakoya. Zile ne brozo robokosha. Zimandoro brozo koboko shatalapa. Raba baba zobo koshanda. Hosa talaproko talapa. Mando, Rimazo Boko Shitalapa, Remazabo Koshinda Lapa, Hosiba Katalabaye. Your presence is with us. Your presence is with us. The highest form, the highest character of your presence is with the new birth. God, we plug in, we plunge in, we connect to, we relate with, we submit to it, we yield to it. May we become bodies wholly filled and flooded with God in self may we through love speaking the truth grow up into him in all things may the world behold you in our soul god and may we be more and more humble every other day to connect to your will and your realities to understand our responsibilities our assignments in this dispensation the power of god is in our spirits the power of god is in our eyes the power of god is in our ears the power of God is in our feet. The power of God is in our dwelling because it dwells in us. He lives in us. In him also we live, move, and have our own being. He is in us as we are all in him. We are filled and flooded with him. His presence is working in our lives. His glory, his face is with us. His face is with us. His countenance shines up on us and is on us that is why I decree and I declare that disease is far from you weakness is far from you poverty is far from you struggle is far from you strife is far from you weakness is far from you you shall not fail you shall not wither you shall not draw back in perdition in the mighty name of Jesus you're going upward and upward only God is on you God is with you his strength is with you his his power is with you. His glory is with you. His mind is with you. His intelligence is with you. His wisdom is with you. His knowledge is with you. His understanding is with you. He is surrounding everything that touches your life. He is prospering you. He is elevating you. Carry this wisdom. Carry this knowledge. If you're sick in your body, sickness cannot dwell in the temple of God. For he shares not his glory with another. I decree and I declare that be healed in the mighty name of Jesus. I say be healed in the mighty name of Jesus. I say be healed in the mighty name of Jesus. I say be healed in the mighty name of Jesus. Prosper in the name of Jesus. Go forward in the name of Jesus. Be promoted in the name of Jesus. Walk in the elevations of God in the name of Jesus. Go upward in the name of Jesus. Improve in the name of Jesus. Conquer in the name of Jesus. Supply in the name of Jesus. Feel in the name of Jesus. Walk in the name of Jesus. Hosatalaba. Father, we thank you. We thank you. We thank you. We thank you. Because you're with us and your presence is with us. And that we behold the purest form of it. The purest form of it. If you're here or there, wherever you are, and you've never given your life to Christ, I want to give you an opportunity, an opportunity to embrace this form every new creature has. And your life will never be the same again. He shed his blood for you. That not only would you live a victorious life on earth, but most importantly, is that you'd inherit eternal life and be one with God. We don't die, we'll live. And so I'll ask you to repeat this as after me. You say, Lord Jesus, I receive you in my heart as my Lord and Savior. I believe that you died for my sins and was raised for my glory. I'm born again. Amen. The message you have just heard was brought to you by Fenero Ministries International. For more information, contact us on telephone number 41 466 
1-800-242-4291 or email us at funerocompala at gmail.com. You can also find us on the web at www.funero.org. Or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowships at Uma Multipurpose Hall from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash Fenero. Fenero. Make manifest. <laughs>